Welcome once again to our Tuesday morning class. Even though this is election day, there's no reason why we can't take a few moments out and review some practices, some customs of the Jewish world and of the world in general when it comes to making condolence calls and shiva calls. This is a very, very important thing that we all need to learn how to do. If we don't discuss it in advance, we can say inappropriate things or feel awkward ourselves. So let me talk at first with a general condolence call, and I'm going to put it in this kind of context. In one of my previous congregations, I was heavily involved with the hospice group. I would give talks on a regular basis to the hospice volunteers, and I try to tell them to stay away from talking about theology with the patients they were helping. A standard question always came up, what do I do when somebody dies? Should I go to the funeral? Will, be, will I be allowed to go to the funeral? And then following up on my talk on Jewish practices and talking about the Shiva, and I'll talk about that in a few moments, I try to encourage people, go to the Shiva. Just being there is helpful. So the question, what do I say? And I'm gonna give you the traditional Jewish answer when you go to a shiva, don't say anything. If you're going to say anything, wait for the mourner to speak first. Most of what we say is ridiculous, inane, or offensive. Don't say he or she is in a better place. I don't want to hear that. Other people don't want to hear it. Don't say at least he or she isn't suffering anymore, even if that's true. Don't come up with those kinds of consoling words, which other people in other religious groups do come up with. Many times I'll see obituary notices in the paper that'll say so-and-so has gone home to the Lord. We don't speak that way. We're there to comfort and let the mourner know the mourner is not alone. Let me talk about the Shiva. The word Shiva is the Hebrew word for seven. From the time of burial, seven days of intense mourning. But really, it boils down to five days. What do I mean by that? Shabbat doesn't count. You're not allowed to mourn on Shabbat. So you're not sitting Shiva on Shabbat. And the seven days are part thereof. So even if the funeral is late in the afternoon, what's left of that day up until sundown is considered a full day of sitting Shiva. Another time, another place we can get into the details of when the Shiva is canceled, if a major festival occurs on the next day, that's another story. We don't need to talk about it now. But I want to bring up some thoughts of how I perceive the Shiva. The Shiva is for the mourners. Today, many people, Reform Jews in particular, will not sit Shiva for seven days. It is more of a burden or an inconvenience than it's worth. And if it's not comforting to you, I would not force myself into doing it. I know that's a new and radical perspective. You as a mourner, are not supposed to do anything. You are so stricken with grief. You stay at home. You don't cook. The community or the more distant relatives will bring food over to you. And food plays an important part in the Shiva. You're supposed to have your meals and usually there's food out and available, especially after the religious service, which I'll talk about shortly. It's not just to have food, it's to talk about the purpose of food. And I'm giving again my own perspective on this. 
At a time of death, you may say, how can I eat at a time like this? Well, we're under an obligation to eat. We're under an obligation to give ourselves strength to continue. After the burial, you go back to the house. You are under the obligation to eat. I'm usually asked as a rabbi to say a bracha. The appropriate benediction you say before you eat. But it is my custom beforehand to say, again, what I just said a second ago. You may say, how can I eat at a time like this where we're under the obligation to sustain ourselves? Now, if you are going to be at home and you're not going out, I'm here, I'm thinking in very traditional historical terms, you would not go to the synagogue for a religious service. And I'm talking here about the daily service. Shabbat, you're going to go to the synagogue because you're not sitting Shiva anymore. The community comes to you. The community makes the minion, the quorum in your house. So you have that minion, you have that quorum in order to say Kaddish. For many of us, we're time pressed, we're going in 15 directions at once. People think the purpose of the Shiva is to have the service and say Kaddish and then they leave. And that is important. I want to add something. It's the idea of being there, of visiting, of comforting the bereaved. And even if you come in the middle of the afternoon when there isn't a service, that's important too. In fact, people have said that you have all those people coming to comfort you and it really hits, the grief really hits after the Shiva when you're left alone. So that is why in a way we need to do follow-up calls after the Shiva. We are bringing the community to the mourners to give them strength, to let them know they are not alone in the world. Now, again, I'm getting back to what I said with regard to hospice. A hospice worker would say, how can I go to the Shiva? I've explained what it is they understand, but they feel awkward. I really won't know anybody there. Or you or I will hear about somebody who passed away and in the obituary notice, it says there'll be a Shiva on such and such a night at such and such a time. And I'm gonna to say to myself, I hardly knew the person. Or maybe I did know the person, but their family, I don't know at all. I'm awkward about going. That shouldn't stop you. In fact, the people who are least expected, not just the close friends, not just the family members, but the distant people, the strangers and so forth. And I have stories up and down of people who show up at a shiva and go over to the bereaved and introduce themselves and say, you know, you don't know me, but I mean, one of the most touching examples, and it's from over 30 years ago, a woman who wasn't so young herself had just lost her mother. And at the Shiva, somebody comes in. This gentleman must have been at least 100 years old from the look of him and putting everything in context. And he says to this daughter, who again, wasn't so young, you don't remember me, but I remember you and your mother I was your milkman when you were a little girl. Well, that puts it in context who has a milkman anymore. But you know what I mean? Just to touch base, just to connect. Let me ask a question. You answer it to yourself. How many of you, and this is not such a Jewish question, but still, have been to a visitation or worse, a viewing before the funeral service. It is not uncommon in the non-Jewish world that you go to the funeral home or wherever. Sometimes the casket is closed. Sometimes the casket is open, which is not a Jewish custom, by the way. My own position is I am not comfortable in the slightest with open caskets. If a family insists upon it, I'll compromise, have the casket open, but when we start the service, please close it. It's my compromise. Jewishly speaking, you're not supposed to start consoling the mourners because they can't even begin to heal until the burial has taken place. 
So from a Jewish perspective, it's not the visitation before the funeral and burial, it's the Shiva after. Now the custom today is that we pick up whatever practices are in the world around us. And a lot of people go to visitations and have visitations because it's the only way some people can come in and express their condolences. They don't have time to go to a shiva. They can drop in for five minutes this way. And looking at that from that perspective, I can see its value. And if that's what people want, we are changing our practices and our customs constantly. There is absolutely no doubt about the fact that we are influenced by the world around us. I should try, maybe on another occasion, because we need a lot of time to do it, to talk about Kaddish. I think we need to have a session where we'll sit down and go through the Kaddish and translate it word for word. It's basically praising God. The Kaddish, the mourner's Kaddish, which we call mourner's Kaddish, doesn't mention dead. It doesn't mention the dead. You have a special Kaddish, so there's several of them, the burial Kaddish, which does, but hardly anybody says that because the Aramaic, they're full of tongue twisters, and if you're not used to it, nobody's going to be able to say it. And if you, the rabbi tries to get people to say it, they'll just be awkwardness. What are we doing when we say Kaddish? Are we praising God? Because nonetheless, despite the fact we've lost a loved one, we still are able to praise God? Yes. And I have often used that explanation. As we have the explanation of saying, the eternal one gives, the eternal one takes away, praise be the name of the eternal one. At the beginning of the service which we have for a funeral or a burial. All kinds of customs exist. I have said at the time of death, this is not always the best time to have a seminar on Jewish customs. Maybe we can get together on other occasions and learn more. A member of the congregation sent me an interesting piece about the Shloshim. Shloshim means 30. On the 30th day, again, a different period of mourning ends. If you're mourning for a parent, it's for a year. You're supposed to mourn for a parent more than anyone else. You may argue and say it is far more painful to lose a child. I understand completely. I know what you're saying. But again, the traditional Jewish perspective, no matter how much you maybe even dislike that parent, without the parents, you wouldn't be here. If it's for a child, a sibling, a spouse, it's 30 days, not a year. But too many people can't live with that and need to do the year. And I won't argue with them. Of course, I won't argue with them. At the Shloshim, another period of mourning becomes less intense afterwards. In many cases, if the deceased is a well-known person, there'd be a special ceremony at the Shloshim where special eulogies, not just one, but many would be given. And by the way, the word eulogy, it's in English, it comes from the Greek, it means to praise. We are praising the deceased. In my practice, in my custom, the idea is to talk about what the deceased did to make the world and all of us who are there better. We are not there to try to tap the secrets of the universe and to explain what happened. We're not there to try to explain death. We are there to celebrate life. And sometimes, by the way, thinking of that expression, when uh, we've had some burials during this COVID period where it's been impossible to have the traditional get together and funeral. Oftentimes at our congregation, we encourage people afterwards to come back to our building where we can sort of, the family can host something where we can all eat together and visit together. Well, it hasn't been possible. 
And at a different time, maybe we will get people to come back. I encourage, I offer that and say, we'll have a celebration of life. And that is the goal of it all. When we go to a visitation in the non-Jewish sense, and I've been to them and I've stood in line and I can see, I have to say this, the, the weariness on the part of the mourners who've been standing there for an hour or two and having to pull themselves together. I try not to say too much. They're tired, they don't need my long speech. If I wanna give it to them, I'll give it to them at a different time when maybe they can use that kind of human contact even more. When we go to a shiva, we go to a person's home, we come in, we're part of a community, we're there to support. Now, one of the interesting things, I've talked about this on other occasions, the minion, the required quorum. It forces us to be a community. If you're all by yourself, of course, we're modern people, we're gonna change the rules. We're not gonna say, I won't say Kaddish because I can't find a minion. But if there is a minion there, and from traditional perspective, it doesn't matter if you know the people or not, or even if you like them. We're forming a community to support you. So I hope I've shared a few thoughts and a few ideas. I could say a lot more. This is my preliminary introduction. And in a few moments, we're going to open this up, share some thoughts ask questions. I am ready, willing, and able after this November series of Tuesday morning classes to do more on any topic that seems to need more response or more time. We limit ourselves to what we can do. That's what life is all about. But there is no reason why we can't, for example, do more on other occasions. I hope this has been of some value. If you've got questions, feel free to ask. Don't be embarrassed because the most difficult thing, and I guess the most embarrassing thing, is to go to a shiva or to go to a visitation and not know what to do and feel awkward. And sometimes I know just taking the burden off and saying, I don't have to come up with some cutesy little inane spiritual whatever comment to make the person feel better. Maybe there's no way I can make the person feel better except by letting that person know at this time of grief, you are not alone. Thank you for joining us. And I hope I am looking at my computer here and trying to make sure I press the right button because we are all learning all kinds of things and I'm still